I want to make Visa Star Frost work so badly. You have no <laughs> idea. I love that card. So welcome to the Pod of Desires podcast. Today I'm joined by Patrick Hoban right here. How's it going? Pro Yu-Gi-Oh player, one of the goats, might I say. I don't know if others agree. I know a lot of people do though. So how are you doing? Doing good. It's good to be here. Awesome. Fun. So we're here at YCS Lyon. We just had Photon Hypernova dropping. How are yep. you feeling about that? I like it. It's it's really cool. I feel like Tier is probably the best deck ever. And, you know, this weekend we get to play the most powerful version of it. So. Oh, really? And now I know you're usually, if we read your book, for people who don't know, Patrick has a very interesting book on deck building and everything. <laughs> In your book, you like to keep everything relatively secret, usually, you know, keep that deck building edge. However, I did see you play something at a 3v3 today. So I, I won't say on here, though this isn't going out until, <laughs> until Monday or so. Sure. Do you actually think what you were playing today is the most powerful version of it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do. I, I It's really good. I, if it's not coming out till Monday, I, it might as well. Right? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, well, sure, at that sure. point. I mean, it's like the, a tier deck that can lock all your zones. So like, right. I feel so like it's, that's, it's a cash tier type of deck? Yeah. Okay, that, that's interesting. I also saw a barrier statue in there. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I was hiding it because uh, I keep seeing lava golems everywhere. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah so a lot I just of figured I'd playing. do something different yeah, after but... side decking because of that. Some people are also playing sphere mode, though. That would be kind of scary. I had sphere mode in my side deck today, um, but I'm, I'm playing lava golem tomorrow instead. I was playing a game last week, and the difference of it being sphere mode versus lava golem actually cost me a game. So I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find lava golem. Oh, okay, damn. Usually, the way we do this podcast, we have like three segments. First, we have okay. news, then we have the guest, and then we have the game. Okay. So for news, uh, we kind of already talked a little bit about Foot and Hypernova just now, but the other big news we had, uh, dropping kind of like a bombshell a few days ago, was yeah. a new ban list. Yeah, yeah. So what are your thoughts on that one? I think it's really cool. I mean, I obviously really like the tier deck, but I also like change more than anything, just because I feel like after big changes in the game, like whether it's new sets or like really impactful ban lists, I feel like those are the most winnable times in the game. Mm -hmm. And so definitely a huge change. So it'll shake up the game a lot. I think probably one of the most interesting things about it is right now, one of the things that makes it so that you can't really do anything other than tier is that a lot of it just gets killed off by the tier deck making Dweller. And so it kind of negates a lot of other decks that maybe you could have uh, done well with even mm -hmm. in the tier format. But now if tier's not everywhere, I suspect Dweller won't be on the end of every board anymore. And so I think we'll get a lot of that innovation back too. I see. Do you think it's mostly Dweller or do you also think something like the, the Ishizu cards that mill out your opponent, taking away a lot of their ceiling because you might be milling like their smashers or something like that is also a big... Yeah, the Ishizu thing. cards are like really unfair against mm -hmm. any deck that's not tier. Milling five and then you trigger multiple things. It's just like... Any deck that's not doing that has a really hard time like competing with the deck that is, I think. The ban list, in your opinion, does it murder tier? Or is it just an engine now? I would be surprised if tier is still like, good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's still really powerful. I think probably the thing you have to figure out is like what you're going to do with the fusions mm -hmm. if you were going to play it. You see people gravitating towards like King of the Swamp, things like that. I don't know if I think that's the right way to go. I don't have anything better <laughs> necessarily but i do think that the first problem that you have to solve is like what you're actually trying to fuse into i've personally seen a lot of cope people saying look at my end board i can still make it and i'm like yeah but through no interruption yeah. i can make a very scary board with anything <laughs> yeah yeah 100 yeah. percent every yeah. time <laughs> yeah it, it feels it feels very very weakened now now beyond the tears coming on uh, there's also some other cards coming off for example ancient, ancient fairy, fairy right? yeah, yeah. That, that ancient fairy i really like uh it's one of my favorite cards the the errata doesn't seem very impactful it just mm -hmm. makes it so you can't search the same field spell that you popped but all the field spells are once per turn anyway so mm -hmm. i think it's basically ancient fairy is kind of at full power so that's right. exciting so i can imagine since you like to always build like the highest ceiling version of anything this will let you make some crazy pile yeah it's a very is my kind of card for yeah, sure yeah, yeah, absolutely <laughs> i'm very excited to see what you actually do with that because i've been thinking about it and it's been keeping me up for sure just being able to special from hand i think is like so oh, good yeah, off yeah. Ancient Fairy you can too. also play around adventure because of that like you might have a ride of our emissary activated so you couldn't really normal summon yeah, anything. yeah 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 now you can because that thing just you know has a saryuja skill on top for some reason i i think that's a really powerful dynamic in general like one thing i'm always scared of is playing too many normal summons and so like if you're playing a deck with ancient fairy it matters less mm -hmm. so i think that's impactful in itself 
Yeah, really, really crazy card. That is kind of the main news that I was thinking of, banlist wise, and then Photon Hypernova being uh, potentially impactful. With Tear gone, and you already being on some kind of hybrid, do you think there will be like a power vacuum around Kashtira or something <laughs> like that? Or do you think that because the Shizu cards are gone, a lot of other strategies are going to become so much more good that it's worth it. Yeah, I, I guess I feel about Kashtira kind of how I feel about Sprite in that I like them as an engine more than I like them as a standalone deck. Okay. I think as a standalone deck, they lose to a lot of cards, yes. essentially. Like, they don't often put up their own negates, and so they just, like, lose to every going second card there is. But I think mixing it with anything else, I, I think they are really powerful cards, so you can mm -hmm. kind of, like, get the advantages of it without playing in such a linear way. Yes, locking yourself into just Xyz and so forth. Yeah. So now I would like to go over kind of just talking about you. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually initially learned about you from a friend, Noman. I don't know if you have ever actually met him. And he told me like, read the book. <laughs> Basically, I, I wasn't topping for shit in another card game called Vanguard. Yep, I, I've I, heard of Vanguard. I just fucking sucked. And he said, read the book. So I was like, <laughs> fine, I'll read the book, I guess. And a lot of little things, you know, started clicking. Then I actually did start topping after after getting, you know, improving the testing. So that was a, a worthwhile $20. Awesome, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for people who don't know, Road of the King, very interesting book. Now, it came out quite a while ago, right? 2016. Yes. Yep. Do you feel like there's things you want to be adding right now? Like, for example, I think you were pretty inspired at some points by Patrick Chapin as well. And he made like these updates to uh, next level magic and next level deck building. Is that something you're interested in? interested in at all now that you're back in the game? I don't know if I think enough has changed yet. Mm -hmm. I think when that point comes, sure, I'd be down to, but right now, all the concepts are the same. The cards are just like more yes. powerful. So I don't, I don't know if I see enough changing right now. Okay, that makes sense. Beyond being a Yu-Gi-Oh player, you're also very into business, right? Yep, you have, I have a startup. A, so you have a startup called, um, it, produce my pronunciation, yeah. is it like in Latin, parvenu, or is it like in American? Parvenu. Parvenu. Yeah. Okay. You know, American. Yeah. Okay, cool. So if you've pivoted since then, I don't know, but at first it was a way for businesses to basically allow you to donate to charity more efficiently. Yeah, it was like AI to personalize what they asked for at checkout. So like mm -hmm. if someone was buying dog food, for example, you could ask them to give to an animal shelter. Yes. Whereas if they're buying like diapers, they could ask them to give to a kid's charity. Yeah. We ended up pivoting away from that during COVID. Okay. Uh, you know, COVID was crazy, definitely. Yes. And so now it's more like a data platform. Okay. Uh, so it's primarily like fundraising teams, sales teams, marketing teams will use it. Mm -hmm. But it's a way of essentially like getting contact data. Would it be fair to say that it's like a SaaS company? Yeah, or? it's a SaaS company. Okay, exactly. cool. Awesome. So uh, you mentioned something pretty interesting. I don't know if that's private. You also had an interesting collaboration at one point with Monday. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Monday.com. <laughs> I, I used to use them as well. Pretty interesting software as well. You flew to Israel for that? Or yeah. That <laughs> yeah, no. I've been using Monday as my project management software, mm -hmm. and they were like putting a big emphasis on like their automations and things like that. Yeah. And they thought I was doing cool things with Monday. So they were like, hey, we'll fly you to Israel if you'll come talk to our office. And I was like, <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, it was really fun. Do you feel then, because you're basically trying to operate at the highest level in two wildly different niches? that that comes with like interesting challenges or do you feel like they complement each other in weird ways that people might not realize? Yeah, I definitely feel like they complement each other. I'd say the biggest downside is I don't have like any anywhere near as much time to play test as I used to. Mm -hmm. But other than that, business is just problem solving, deck building is problem solving. And so mm -hmm. I feel like there are, a lot of things do overlap, just have less hours in your day. <laughs> yes, that, that, that certainly makes sense. From a business perspective though, have you ever considered turning the book into like e-commerce type deal? You know, like having it be not necessarily PDF, but being on like a course platform or something along those lines, because it's much more scalable, of course. Than, like, it is Amazon. more scalable. I thought about it. I didn't really decide a reason to or not, but at this point I haven't done it. So yeah. I guess it's crossed my mind, but I, yes. I haven't like done anything towards doing it, I, I, guess, I suppose. It's also like a time thing, I guess. Like it's, That's probably why it hasn't yeah. come up, I would say, yeah. is, is it's just like the time commitment. At this point, I'd probably just, you know, spend that time on Parvenu. Yes, I imagine, you know, properly scaling Parvenu is like, gonna have way more impact <laughs> than, you know, one, one Yu-Gi-Oh course. No offense to Yu-Gi-Oh players out there, of course. Do you have any like near future goals? I don't believe team? in goals. You, you don't believe in goals? Okay, let's talk goals. about that. Yeah. Why do you not believe in goals? I think they're fine in like a short term kind of sense, yeah. but like long term. Oh yeah, I said near future. <laughs> okay, fair, fair. Okay, fair. I guess still no. <laughs> but... No, no, I'm down. I'm not to talk about it. So. Uh, I feel like they're a little bit of a double-edged sword. Like mm -hmm. I watched a lot of players really want to win a YCS and they'd be like one of the most consistent players in the game in yeah. terms of like topping. And then when they would finally win, mm -hmm. 
and that was the goal, you yeah. know, to win the YCS, which, you know, they inevitably get it. But then you often see them kind of fall off after right. that. And I feel like a big reason is because they got what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so you lose that motivation if you if you do it. And, you know, I, I don't know. I just didn't want to lose motivation. <laughs> OK, that's interesting, because I, I thought your answer would be something along the lines of who cares about a goal? You know, you just set like things you need to do and you do them regardless of goals but it's it's a completely different spin for you it's really a motivation type of deal yeah it's it's definitely motivation i think it can also it can work against you too like let's say you have like a really long-term goal and then at a certain point you know you're gonna get there but you haven't yet i think knowing that you're that it, it's going to come can essentially like make it take longer because right. now you don't see the need to put in as much effort because you know what's gonna happen mm -hmm. whereas if you just don't have goals then that doesn't apply <laughs> right one other thing too okay is like goals, they're kind of specific by definition. Yes. Right. And be. yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like by focusing on like really specific things, you get rid of the ability to kind of surprise yourself with seeing what's possible. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like, yeah, you could say I want to do X, but then what if you could have done something way more and because you were so focused on X, you, you just didn't know that was ever going to be possible. Right. So to put that in like Yu-Gi-Oh! player perspective, it would be like, oh, I want to really top 32 a YCS and then you hit top 32 and then you just start misplaying like mad because, well, sure. I got my top 32. So there's actually another uh, really good player I had on just a few hours ago, uh, Hani. Hani. I, I believe <laughs> you're, you're friends. Yep. You and him, I think, have one very, very big difference in the terms of approaching the game. And that is, he actually is totally fine now with sharing his dicks mm -hmm. because he's like, I'm testing so much, I will outplay them anyway. And you're more like the deck building edge is like crucial, right? Yeah, I mean, I do think technical play is an advantage. Mm -hmm. It's just at the end of the day, like when you sit down, like the guy that also practiced for the YCS, you could be the best player in the world. And the guy sitting across from you is still 80% as good as you. Yes. And so, yeah, the, that 20% does matter and it will win you extra games, but... I feel like if you want to win like multiple events, then deck building is like the real thing to focus on rather than technical play. Right, that makes sense. So it's a diminishing return type of deal. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Whereas I feel like it, when you get the deck building thing right, which you often don't, when you do get it right, like those are when you win the YCS, I think. <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. And you've done that a couple times. <laughs> or, uh... <laughs> so one thing um, that we also see quite a, a few times in, in the book is the whole upstart goblin thing, right? Mm -hmm. so a lot of people know you as the guy who was always playing three upstart goblin because it made your deck, you know, ever so slightly more consistent. But then recently, because cards became so good, you started going away from that. You were starting to play like 44 cards or something because there was plenty of power anyway. Yeah, sure. I guess the reason for that is... 40 is kind of an arbitrary number. Yes. Like, it's what Konami says the minimum is, so that's a minimum. But if you could play any number of cards, then it wouldn't probably be 40. And I think for the vast, vast majority of Yu-Gi-Oh, it's probably well under 40. Yes. Like, it was probably like 30 to 35 kind yes. of thing. But you couldn't do that, so Upstart just lets you get closer to mm -hmm. that ideal number. Whereas now, as the cards get better with every single set, the extra cards essentially give you more power. And as long as you're not having to give up consistency, which as long as, you know, cards like Sprint, for example, come out where you can now access your deck without having to draw it. And I think, you know, every set more and more of those cards come out that I think you don't have to give up as much of that consistency to go over as you used to. And so I think the inevitable direction of the game is that everything will play 60 and that at any for any given deck in any given format, they're somewhere along that line. Right. I have a very hot take that okay. jumps from that. Let's go. We're always like, oh, more, more consistent at 40, more consistent at 40. That has been the thing everyone has been, you know, saying for so long now. Another thing people have been saying for so long is if you really want to draw a card, you want it at three, you know, something along those lines, because you want to see your best cards more often. However, if cards keep on getting more and more powerful, but also once per turn, yep. and they start fulfilling the same roles so closely, won't it become optimal to run a shit ton of two offs? Because imagine you have like a board breaker, like Triple Tactic, Silence, and Dark Ruler no more, mm -hmm. who are kind of performing the same role, who are both once per turn. Once we get Triple Tactics, you know, 3.0 and Dark Ruler 5.0, yep. we might get to a point where it's like two Dark Ruler, two Triple Tactics, because it's much better to draw one of each in no matter the situation than two of either. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Like, you know, the, the percentage chance that you draw two 
of any three of and like a 40 card deck is still only like a one percent mm -hmm. but if half your deck is three of yes then you know it does compound into something larger and it could definitely you know affect you over the course of the tournament so i agree that i think that you know playing not three copies of every single thing is often correct like i'm playing two fenrir this weekend yeah for an example so mm -hmm. like yeah um but what i think might even be a better version of that is something like the new like thrust Mm -hmm. and playing a one of right because now it's like i can have a four of when it's good or a one of when it wasn't good yes. and so you can kind of you, you get more control over it basically yeah. i'm actually playing something very similar to that i'm playing a one rate the field spell one fenrir one terra so mm. to me that's three fenrir but yeah well i i, I still maxed cool. out on yeah. all of those yeah, 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 you might be maxing out but that's <laughs> also i'm not playing them. the big kashiro package sure yeah just like the but yeah, I mean, I'm not a Hoban right here, so <laughs> pr pretty big uh, difference. I think we've talked a lot about the news. Um, we've talked quite a bit about you, also about the game, though. But really generic. How do you actually like Yu-Gi-Oh! currently? I like it a lot. It's really cool. You know, I like when cards are powerful. This most recent format's probably been the most powerful we've ever had. So I really enjoy that. And mm -hmm. even though it's going to get taken down on the power level for sure now with the ban list, mm -hmm. I think for the last 20 years, the general direction has been every few months more powerful cards get released yes. than, than we're already out. And so I like that effect. Given that we keep on getting these super powerful cards and we just had this nuke ban list, is there any deck you're currently like itching to start testing? You don't have to spoil you know, specifics, but is there anything you have in mind where I'm like, damn, I really got to try this weird idea. Dude, I, right I want to make Visa Starfrost work so badly. You have no <laughs> idea. I love that card. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Trivic Karma now searches you anything, yeah. right? So Goods plus Trivic Karma, Visa Starfrost. My friends will tell you how much of their time I waste talking about Visas. <laughs> Do you not find, like, it's kind of just a Baron slot? No, no, I feel like I could do way more yeah, than that. That's yeah, what I've, been, I've been like, yeah, this thing. Like you can do stuff Sharon. with the scare claws, like a oh, bunch of okay, stuff. Okay, okay. It can make Beatrice. It can do a lot of cool things. Oh, that's true. It can make Beatrice. Damn, I, I have been sleeping on Visa Starfrost, I guess, then. But maybe your entire friend group has been sleeping <laughs> on Visa Starfrost from uh, the sounds of it. On the Pod of Desires, uh, also, Pod of Greed was taken. It's, it's very sad that we had to settle for Pod of Desires in the game, but it is what it is. It does bring one little pro, and that is that we end every single episode with uh, the desire question. So okay. what is like one desire you have right now for the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! Or for personal life, anything you can imagine. First one that came to mind was, it should be like this year that we should get a big rule change, right? Because it's it's been every three years. Oh, a Master Rule uh, 6 type deal? Yeah, and so I, I imagine that's this year. Maybe they'll like push it back an extra year because of COVID or something. Mm -hmm. But in general, it should be coming up when mm -hmm. that big rule changes. What I would like that to be would be, let's say you go summon Armageddon Knight, you could send a dark monster from your side deck to the graveyard. I feel Whoa. like that would raise the power level of the game, oh make all my. the decks much more consistent, but it still comes with a trade-off because now- Your side deck is smaller. Now your side deck's smaller, exactly. This kind of reminds me, however, of uh, the thing Magic had. Magic the Gathering had this new thing a few years ago where they could summon uh, certain monsters from outside of the game. Really? If Yeah, if their deck had like a certain difference, like maybe all your decks only had two or four mana cards, mm -hmm. and then suddenly you could access this bullshit broken card even if it wasn't in your hand. Feels like it can get out of control. Yeah, like, pre yeah, pretty for quickly. Sure. <laughs> I mean, it might but be a exciting. mistake, but it would have been really fun. <laughs> yeah, for a deck builder, it's definitely something really cool. That's a really good answer. So yeah, I might have like 15 garnets in my side deck. <laughs> I don't need a side deck <laughs> if I, I could do that. I mean, I'm, I'm down. That sounds awesome. Finishing off, any shout outs? Anything you want to call out? Any Anything you want to promote? Shout out to RMC. Shout out to my boys. Came here with all, all my friends. And yeah, excited for the YCS this weekend. Awesome. Good luck. Of Thank course. you. I appreciate it. Cool. And I will see you soon. Ciao.